Flick it. Oh, good afternoon. So uh, I was going to wing this conversation. And then uh, hearing the terrific talks yesterday and this morning, I decided I better put together some overheads. <laughs> and so I did. And my overheads are going to strike you immediately as odd because I'm going to be integrating two things that often don't get discussed in the same conversation, uh, scientific research methodology and social justice. So let me share with you why I uh, believe we need to have this focus. The assumption I'm making is that in practitioner research partnerships, it's the role and the responsibility of the researcher to provide the best possible theory predicated and methodologically rigorous evidence about the ways in which programs contribute to positive youth development in ecologically valid and ecologically meaningful ways. And I'll come back several times to what I mean by all of these words, but ecologically valid means that they, that we are providing evidence in partnership with practitioners that explains how real kids are developing in real situations that is meaningful to those young people, as opposed to what's meaningful to uh, academics who are interested in getting their grants funded and publications published, which is important as well to keep us going, but the bottom line is that first assumption. So I believe and I will argue that partnerships based on this assumption enable us in partnership with practitioners to contribute to the promotion of social justice. I'm going to do it this, this way. Thank you. Okay. So uh, the first thing we need to think about is who are we involving in our programs? Or who's in our sample if we're doing a study of a program of, uh, impact? Uh, there's two ways of thinking about this. Who are we reaching? But who are we not reaching? We've talked about very diverse participants, but that doesn't mean we're reaching those kids who we believe, for other reasons, health disparities, racial ethnic disparities, racism, poverty, persistent and pervasive poverty, have never been in a program and have no likelihood of ever getting into a program given their current conditions. Some of you may know the work of Ananda Roberts, who runs a program, well, it's a national program, or it's a company, actually, uh, uh, for data uh, generation, data management, like she manages the health system for the United States military. So, uh, but she's very interested in trying to understand who we're not reaching by our programs. When we think about the fact that there are millions of kids in this country who are not in youth development programs, this leads us to another set of questions. And it really leads us to a consideration of the models, the structural models or the theoretical models, and then the measurement models we use in our research. Now today, uh, I, well I stood here four years ago and claimed that if you look at uh, Reed's work or Ann Maston's work or Margaret Spencer's work or Steve Hamilton and Mary Agnes Hamilton's work or Peter Benson's work or uh, Bill Damon's work, all of us have a common meta model of development, relational developmental systems. We believe that development happens not through a process of genetic unfolding or passive shaping by the environment, but really by bi-directional relations between an active individual and an equally active, changing, complex, multi-level world. And it's those relations, those system connections that involves development or that in provides the basic process of development. Uh, do our models and then the, me the measures we use to index our models think about our theory of change and our logic models uh, in, in an evaluation project. Do our models and measure apply to all youth, including those youth that have never been in programs? And do the, the models and measures apply in the same way for all youth? We really have no answers to these two questions. 
So several people have thought about this. I mentioned this briefly yesterday, and I'll come back to uh, Greg Duncan in a moment. But Mark Bornstein, who uh, is a developmental psychologist, started as an infant psychologist. He's now into uh, late adolescence, young adulthood, because his longitudinal samples have aged. He's remarkably stayed the same age, but his samples have gotten older. Uh, he has specified what he calls his uh, specificity principle. And it asks a complex, multi-level integrated question. And this should be the question that answers uh, do our models and measures apply in the same way for all youth? Because the question we should be asking is, what scores from what measures provide what evidence for what youth in what programs, living in what conditions, at what points in ontogenetic, that's developmental time, uh, preschool, middle school, high school, and historical time. The point of Mark's questions is that development happens to individuals, not to groups. Development is intra-individual change, it's not group change. Every kid in your program needs to be understood as a distinct, unique individual. And that time and place matter. Developmental time, but also historical time. Dale talked about how far we've come in 30 years. I would add one other element to that very concise and completely accurate uh, uh, historical synopsis. 30 years ago, we defined good in adolescence as the absence of bad. Kids were doing well, kids were thriving when they didn't smoke, they didn't drink, they didn't drop out, they didn't bully, they didn't engage in unsafe sex. We had no vocabulary for positive youth development. And then it was people like some of the people in this room, the late Peter Benson, who came around and begin, began talking about the seas of positive development or the developmental assets of youth. And I just want to correct one statement. The seas were invented by Rick Little, not by Rich Lerner. Rick Little is a practitioner. I just was smart enough to realize there was a good idea there and I try to capitalize on it. But let's give a practitioner the credit for developing those C's. And I can tell you the story about how he evolved them from four C's to five C's to six C's. So time and place matter. A point made by Yuri Bronfenbrenner and Glenn Elder, for those of you who are in the developmental science literature. Now, I, I mentioned yesterday briefly that Greg Duncan, an economist, a, a National Academy of Sciences uh, member, uh, has talked about the robustness of our analyses. He's very worried that many of our findings are very fragile because we don't replicate. And I mentioned that e even meta-analyses are not sufficient because meta-analyses are based on what happens in the literature and some things that get into the literature are not the sum total of all the studies ever done. So uh, he talks about how we can uh, go beyond just these fragile findings and look at robustness. And he has several ways of looking at that, replicating findings across different data sets within the same study. So you're triangulating across data sets, comparing groups through nested regression analyses, two methods that I'll come back later that came from uh, econometric modeling, Jim Heckman and other people, uh, propensity score analysis, instrumental variant variable analysis, and I'll mention the third, regression discontinuity designs, and then subgroup analyses. Yes, you might make uh, uh, treatment, non-treatment uh, uh, comparisons, but what about the boys and the girls? What about the different age periods, or be a proper, subtle differences between the 13-year-olds and the 14-year-olds? What about kids with different religions or different family structures? Do the results hold across those subgroup analyses? So, we need to triangulate, but we also need to recognize that if we're going to be ecologically valid in our work, we need to triangulate across qualitative and quantitative methods. And one change that's happened over the past 30 years is that Richard Lerner uses the word qualitative research in his discussions. Uh, because I was trained by someone whose picture will be up here in a few minutes to think that qualitative research meant uh, computation of a chi-square. 
Uh, I, I now have gone a little bit beyond that. Uh, so we need to return to our roots and remember that we can measure things through uh, triangulation by using the classic Campbell and Fisk multi-trait, multi-method matrix methodology to get at conversion and discriminant validation. For the practitioners, don't worry about it. For the researchers, I just want to remind you that that's been out there since 1959. And we also now have various rigorous factor analytic ways of looking at measurement invariance across uh, uh, measures, across groups, across time. And there are weak, moderate, and strong tests for such statistical invariance. What about data analysis? Everybody's favorite topic. So I'm going to spend the next hour talking. No. <laughs> OK, I'm going to go over this very quickly. Some of these slides, which Ellen can get to you, uh, uh, have more information than I, I'm just going to wave my hands at this because of time issues, but I just want to put these up here. So the difference that I want to talk about is that we're in the business of studying development, which involves intra-individual change within a person. We're, we don't really care about how self-esteem behaves across time. What we want to know is what are kids' self-esteem, what is kids' self-esteem like across time. We're in the business of studying, improving, enhancing the lives of people, not variables. Yet, over 90% of all the analyses done in the leading journals are variable-centered analyses. They're not person-centered analyses. And in the jargon, this is that they are a very famous psychometrician, Raymond B. Cattell. These are uh, R-centered analyses or variable-centered analyses instead of P or person-centered analyses. So are we really assessing intra-individual change or just assessing differences between people, inter-individual differences, and summarizing group data? Here's the mean at this time, and here's the mean at a second and a third time. The fact of the matter is, the truth is, that you can have a mean that remains unchanged, a variance that remains unchanged, and a perfect correlation from time one to two and two to three. And those group summary statistics have nothing to do whatsoever with intra-individual change. So one of the things I would like to do, Bart, is c come in to look at the data you presented today and look at the individual change trajectories of the kids for hit, well, when you said there's no difference. We found nothing. We just found nothing across uh, four uh, times of measurement among Cub Scouts. And when we looked at the intra-individual change trajectories, that we got quite a different picture. Now you say, well, how in the world do you do that? Aha. Two geniuses, Peter Molinar from Penn State and John Nesselrode from uh, University of Virginia. And I had the opportunity to spend uh, some time last night. My students and I had some uh, time with John last night. So they have invented two techniques, or not invented, but in invented an integration of two techniques, something called dynamic factor analysis and the ideographic filter. Unless you're a statistics nerd, you can forget about this. Just know, as I go over these slides, that we now have techniques. The researchers partnering with you have techniques that can look at the individual kids in your program and see what the program is doing at a very nuanced level. All we need is multiple times of testing and we can understand the nature of those dynamic changes within kids. So very quickly, uh, we have been focusing all our work, I'll, I'll get there close to Pi. We, uh, we have been focusing all of our statistical analyses on group data. We have to assume two things when we analyze data. We have a group of 100 kids. In order to calculate a mean at time one and a mean at time two for that data, we have to assume that every kid in our sample is the same. If not, we can't calculate an average. It's mixing apples and oranges, or pomegranates and pineapples and bananas and all these different fruits and, that go into the supermarket. We have to assume everybody's an apple. And then we have to assume that apple stays the same across time, their stationarity. But we know not every kid is the same, and we know 
that kids develop. So why in the world, if we're developmental scientists, are we using statistical methods that rest on assuming that every kid is the same and every time is the same? So they reject this and say, let's come up with tools that allow us to understand the dynamics of what's going on within a kid across time. So they've developed uh, a thing called the dynamic factor model, which allows us to look at the variance with, within a kid across time and how that's linked developmentally. And then they develop something called the ideographic filter, which says, still allowing each kid to be an individual, we can now look at those individuals and see if there's any generality that we can take away. Like kids in this program are doing better than that program, even though they're doing better in very individually different ways. That's much stronger for us as a field than starting with the assumption that every kid is the same and there's no difference across time. This allows us to capture that individuality, that uniqueness of every kid that we work with and then relate that to our program. Uh, so by putting together the dynamic factor model and the ideographic filter, we're able to do something that we've never been able to do before statistically. Study each person as a dynamic changing individual. There's other ways of doing this, even more sophisticated ways. Uh, uh, Molinar and Nesselrode's work is an example, not of linear models, Dale, of you know, the sort of linear equations, which you know, most of us were trained to think about, but systems methods, where you're looking at the entire system. And uh, so there's now a whole, this doesn't have a pointer on it, but there's a whole bunch of systems science methods that I've just listed there that allow us to capture the kid as an individual in the context of all the other individuals with your program understood as an integrated whole. And with that we could depict the program as a whole as it's moving across time populated by distinct individuals. Is that more complex? Yes. But is that what you're dealing with on the ground? Real kids who are different each from the other in a unique program? We now have the statistical tools to work with you. A lingering effect in all of our work is selection effects. You can't randomly assign someone to be in 4-H or, or Scouts or uh, uh, any other program. And that's called the technical word that, that, that uh, economists use is endogeneity, self-selection effects. But there, again, I'm going to wave my hands at these. There are these incredibly powerful techniques that allow us to partition the variance in program effects versus kid effects in very powerful ways, and uh, the econometricians have developed this. Jim Heckman, as you know, or may not know, but he is a Nobel laureate, and uh, he has a lot of credibility in these uh, techniques. Uh, this tells you how to think about propensity score analysis, which is one very popular way. Uh, instrumental variable analysis, which is another strong way, and I give an example there of, of of what it, uh, an instrument is in this research. Yet another way, uh, uh, regression discontinuity, which might work in many of your programs, because all you need is uh, uh, a pre-post relation. Uh, Bill Trochum from Cornell has written extensively about this. And then we need to rethink, uh, and Patrick and I may disagree about this, but we need to rethink about the randomized control trials. Traditionally, you have this, uh, you have a treatment group and uh, a non-treatment group. But the goal of doing an RCT, which is an important tool in the, in the quiver of developmental science, is that we want to know how much of the variation in that second X is due to the treatment and due to nothing else. That's what we want to know. How much of the variance is due to your program? And uh, so you need two other control groups, say uh, Dick Solomon and his colleague Lazak way back in 68. You need a group that controls for the, uh, uh, so this is groups one and two. You have the original control group. The second or the additional control group now is you don't give a pretest so you can take out the variance associated with 
what was the initial entry level behavior of the person. So you're getting, if you will, a base free measure of change. And then there's something called development. <laughs> Kids change just because they develop or mature. And that third group uh, gives you an appraisal of that. So we need to do RCTs with all of these control groups so that we can adequately partition the variance. So now, quickly, let me return to social justice. I think I have just two more slides. Uh, so social justice, I'm arguing, if we're in this partnership, if researchers and practitioners are in a true partnership, you do what you do well, we do what we do well. Theory predicated, methodologically rigorous research that has ecological validity or, or true world validity. The plasticity of development that comes about because of our understanding of these bi-directional person context models allows us to understand that every young person has strength by virtue of the fact that they can change, that they're not fixed by this false notion of what genes are, uh, that there's malleability and um, hence imp potential for improvability in life, means that we can act in ways to enhance those trajectories of change and to increase the probability that all young people will thrive. Back in 2008, Lerner and Overton, uh, why, why, what's so funny? That's Lerner and Overton. I don't know what was funny there. But anyway, uh, it's 2014. I aged a lot since 2008. That's, that's the reason. So Lerner and Overton said that we could take our theories about person context relations, marry those ideas with rigorous methodology, and work with community based programs to lower the probability that kids who come from different ecological contexts will necessarily have that horrendous, horrendously unfair disparity in those number of hours that you so well characterized. So I want to close with this last thing. We, we argued in 2008 that what we should do as researchers is identify how community-based youth development programs may change those person context relations to enhance the probability that individuals, no matter what their individual characteristics are, which we can now capture in our research, no matter their contextual circumstances, which we can now capture through our systems science methods, will move forward to in, uh, having a equivalent opportunity to live lives of dignity, merit, and achievement. And if we can do that through a partnership, then we can truly use good science to promote social justice. So thank you. <laughs>